Well, you look at the evidence, uh, new national security strategy at the end of last year, new national defence strategy, initiation of the trade war. But I think the big one, summing all this up, has been Vice President Pence's speech at the Hudson Institute a week or so ago. About the Cold War. Yep. Yeah, yeah, formal, well, he didn't use the word Cold War, and I'm glad he didn't, but a formal, as a word, declaration of the transition from 40 years of strategic engagement to what he calls, and they call, a new period of strategic competition. So my question is simply this, whether it's security, whether it's the economy or the rest of the engagement, if you start to see a decoupling of these two economies and these two countries, then frankly it is an inflection point. It is a big um, headwater of change for the future of the type I certainly haven't seen. Was that just a threat though or do you think that was something more? Too much evidence to, to see it as just a one-off thing. That is, there are about four major strategic documents and decisions coming out of the uh, Trump administration. Certainly in Beijing, when they sat down to have a think about this over the summer, said something has changed here deeply. And it's not just the Republicans. Democrats basically lining up with a new hardline approach towards uh, China. And then you see business, by and large, doing much of the same. So it is a big shift. How the trade dispute, you've, uh, which we've been talking about in recent sessions on this program, unfolds in December is a separate matter, may find a, a tactical resolution, but the strategic nature of the relationship is changing. Maybe that's not a surprise when you realize that China is now the second largest economy and that China has been doing so much to try and exert its influence over the region. And, and, and people are saying more that she has retro. He's, he's gone back to some, some pri uh, almost I don't know all the way back to the little red book, but certainly different than, you know, his predecessor, his more recent predecessors, that he is, it's hardline, again, it, it, like hegemony. That, that, that's, that's, I mean, have you know, is that true? Have you noticed that in terms of, would you characterize it that way as far as President Xi for the last three or four years? Xi Jinping is much more of a nationalist than I've seen any of his predecessors as being. That's the first thing. Secondly, he's more ideological. If you speak to, I was in China a few times over the summer, and you speak to firms about the influence of the party now in relation to normal commercial activity, it's bigger now than it's been in decades. So that's happening. But as Becky said before, there's also a structural factor at work. China's just big, like it's a $12, $13 trillion economy. Uh, you're a $20 trillion economy. There's a structural dynamic which starts to occur, which is uh, a natural competition begins to occur. Right. That's unfolding. But this, this one has the added tinge of having both ideological and nationalist components to it. It's going to take very careful management. I hope we can land this trade thing in the meantime. But there's a broader thing happening. We're supposed to get this fixed before the midterms. I mean, it, this <laughs> sounds like it could go maybe 10 years. Uh, at the, at so much for for November 6th deadline for uh, making up with China. I think that one slid a little bit, Joe. The, uh, <laughs> there've been, the three, there've been yeah. three efforts. November 6, 2025. Uh, yeah, they didn't mention the year. So yeah. uh, there've been three efforts in the last six. Yeah. There've been three efforts in the last six months to try and land this thing. And all of them ultimately came to nothing. Right. Partly because the Chinese offered too little. Then you had deep disagreement in the White House between the different groups uh, of hardliners, middle, middle liners and soft liners on Beijing. So, but I still think we've got one big roll of the dice and that's Buenos Aires and the margins of the G20 summit where I think there's enough self-interest for both sides, particularly given your previous session on the softening of the global economy, to try and land this thing. So, so let me understand, Kevin, because your first set of statements refer to the two poles. So we're going to get two poles in the economy, two poles in technology, two poles in geopolitics. And the middle ground between two poles is pretty hard when both of them are that big. Your second statement seems to suggest that maybe within that regime change, we can get someone pressing the pause button on all the tension that comes from the two poles. So, so where, are, where are you between the two? Do we get a pause button or do we, do we get all the volatility that comes with the transition to two poles? Uh, I think we get both, my friend, and it's <laughs> going to be an untidy mix. Strategically, what I see from all the evidence is a big shift in the tonality and content of the relationship, which means everything for Washington and Beijing, but frankly means everything for the world, given the size of these two, not just economies, but militaries. But the second thing is, up the middle of that, I think you may see the beginnings of a tactical accommodation on the trade question come December. Why? The Chinese domestically are hurting. It's a really impacting, I and mean, Trump has correctly called it in terms of this being a bigger effect on China. 
But I imagine the US side is seeing global softening to some extent. And a big Which, what, what would that look like? Because we had Senator Pat Toomey, Toomey here today and Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin here on Friday, and both of them said that what they think needs to absolutely happen is the, the, the end of forced technology transfer and the end of forced joint ventures for American companies that are setting up to do business in China. Are those two things likely to come? I think what you'll get is, I think what will be on the table will be some deal to radically reduce the bilateral trade deficit, which will be what I would describe as artificially manipulated over right, the next Right, that's not years. the key issue. No, that's not the key issue, yeah. but um, if you're asking what I think they're looking at, I think they're looking at, because my information's about fourth hand and it changes. But the second box is, what do you do about forced technology transfer and what do you do about intellectual property uh, protection and China's industry policy uh, giving its high technology sector a huge state push right. in order to become globally dominant. Now, that I think is going to be captured in a process. Time, time finite, maybe three, six months. And then, to go back to Mohammed's point, I think that becomes the grounds for rolling, right. roiling friction in this relationship.